here we are. Yes, we are. The Broken City Podcast is now back after a long, long hiatus. Mm-hmm. What happened during the hiatus? Well, one, I think I got a little fatter. Um, had a few depressive episodes, a couple anxious episodes. I don't want to hear that. I wrote, oh, hear, the uh, good stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Skip to the good stuff. I wrote some music that wasn't good, so that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Can we hear those bad songs? Here's what happened between the two. The or two? between, yeah, the last episode and this episode. Um, you're here. <laughs> Who are you? Who is this? <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> Who am I? Uh, this is Corey Clark. Hi. Old pal and good, good old buddy. buddy. I've known you 20 years-ish. Yeah. So we met when we were uh, one years old. I like one time you were telling somebody this and you said, back in the 90s. And I was like, whoa. I guess yeah, it was. Late, 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 late 90s? <laughs> that's crazy. Every time I hear 90s now, I just it feels like so nostalgic. Bunch of millennials just push stop on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was... In the 90s. Yeah, we uh, shared a mutual girlfriend, not at the same time. I don't know if you should say we shared a girlfriend. We didn't share. <laughs> we uh, we did, but it was like 10 years apart. More than 10 years, maybe? Yeah. I was currently dating her, and you had dated her years before. I had her first, before. so. <laughs> <laughs> I had her seconds. Yep. Anyways, that's how we met. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yep. And it kind of went through kind of through music, right? Well, you're, so you're being very modest, it was a it was a girl that I knew for a long time. I mm-hmm. Dated a, and then we were just friends for forever, ever. Yeah. And then she was dating you, and she was like, "You have to hear this guy Adam's music. You would love it, especially like she knew that I would dig it." Mm. Uh, and we were like in a band together at the time. She knew it was bad taste. She knew my 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 taste. And I was, of course, I was like, oh, whatever, you know. I want to hear boyfriend's music. Yeah, and why she, would she do that? It's, it sounds like a bad idea. It does idea. sound weird. I mean, but at that point, we had been friends for like, I dated her in high school, so we were in our late, we were probably in like early 20s at that point. Yeah. And so she, she's like, let's go to your car. You know her. Yeah. I don't know if we're allowed to mention names here, but yeah. she's very uh, forceful. And she's like, let's go in your car and listen to it right now. So we did. Wow. I was like, right away, I was like, oh, I get it. And I know why you guys <laughs> listen to this. Just all, yeah. And so I fell in love with your music before I fell in love with you. It was a real, this is a love story, people. Yeah. Yeah. So I was a fan. And then we, we kind of became friends. The thing that stands out the most is that I assumed if you were that into my music and I had my insecurities about it, that I couldn't imagine that... Maybe I knew you were a musician, but I was like, he's probably not very good. Maybe he's just... <laughs> if I liked your music, I wasn't very good. <laughs> I don't know. There's something about that. And so I I remember you... I just I thought you were a cool guy. And uh, I remember you... <laughs> I have vivid memory of burning mm-hmm. CDRs for you. Mm-hmm. And Custom. you you like were adamant about paying for them. Yeah. And I always like, felt this guilt sort of like thing cost me like a dollar and you're wanting to pay like 10 bucks each and i was, was kind of stoked but it was a cd with at least five songs at least each, yeah. each time and i felt morally obligated to to have a problem with that but i also <laughs> was stoked you're buying it but i remember saying to you like dude i mean you know buy I pay for one and i'll give you like five or but you were like didn't care i was like i was, was like a fan a, there's I an was ethic it was yeah. super cool well why not i mean but i remember then we i think I think you might have done a, a coffee house gig with me. Like I did a set and invited you to do a set at uh, at the Starbucks on the corner of Tribuco and El Toro down in Mission Viejo. I never played there with you, but I came and watched you much time. You must have sat in then because I remember hearing you sing there. Oh, maybe. And I, I was like, this guy's better than me. <laughs> what? I don't even remember. I like how music is a competition when you're young like that. Everything's, at least for me, maybe that's why. I think that's a good topic too because. I it's never, it never was for me. That's just not my personality. I've never it was never like sports uh, indoctrinated with competition person. Mm. I never, so I just don't have that in me. But I have known a lot of people that see music like as a sport and like oh, we, this is our team and we have to win. And I'm gonna yeah, you know, it's funny what it is. I think for me at least, the competitive aspect of music is rooted just in I think insecurity and finding yourself in it, and then mm-hmm. also. 
for me, like songwriting and singing, when I discovered doing it or that I had sort of a aptitude for it, I guess, early on or a need to do it, it was like, ooh, like this is my identity. So when your identity get ra- gets wrapped mm. up into it, your value gets wrapped up into it. Right. And then when your value gets wrapped up to it, you go like, well, what value do I have compared to that guy's value? Because oh, yeah. your value ends up being like sort of, there's a way to play well and there's a way to play crappy right. in an objective sense and in a subjective sense. So I think when you, there's all these different layers when you're making music of like, are people going to think this is good? And then are people just right. going to like it and whatever? And then you, if you hear somebody else that's like a contemporary, like somebody who's your age or whatever, right. and you have all your insecurities and it's your identity, <clears throat> yeah. and somebody else is maybe a better singer or a better player or is making better recordings or whatever, that whole mm-hmm. identity value, what's good, what's bad thing, gets all mushed up into one big soup. Right. And then you get competitive. But it's really more insecurity than it is. Because you were basically you were on like a higher... Zen level of support, <laughs> maybe, or yes, what, but then that, that's my own insecurity too. Like, part you just I, count yourself out. If of I'm the really confession. honest with it, yeah. Like, because if I'm not gonna be competitive in my head, then I don't have to, you know, I don't have to like compare myself or something. That's maybe smart. that's part of it. But, <clears throat> but, but like you said, it all gets wrapped up. <clears throat> that's a good point because <clears throat> if, you're <clears throat> if you're making music and you're being creative, then it's completely subjective. Somebody can connect with it or not, or whatever. But the technical aspect is a whole other side to music. So it's almost like you can judge that. You can judge the technical stuff. Right. Like, is this guy a great? Is this guy a good guitar player? Is he a hack? But then again, that doesn't really matter if the song's great if it connects. So there, there's like this weird technical side where you can mm-hmm. kind of be, you know, judge yourself against other people. Yeah. But then the the other creative part of it is like for me, that's like hands off. You can't. You know what I mean? Like, this song isn't better than that song, necessarily. Which, I mean, ironically enough, that's what drew me to singing and songwriting, is like, oh, here's an area where, like, mm-hmm. you it's a safe place to put all your vulnerabilities and everything right. about yourself, and that, like, there is a hugely subjective zone to it, which mm-hmm. kind of threw me out of my perfectionism, which, like, oh, I... Oh, that's interesting. I came up as a drummer... Mm-hmm. And I had sort of like perfectionized myself out of the, out mm-hmm. of loving it. Because I was like, it, if my yeah. time isn't perfect, if my groove isn't rock solid, like if if it, you know, my time isn't metronomically perfect, then I suck. Yeah. And singing and songwriting was like, oh, wow, I can just put my subjective stuff into this. And like that has a value that kind of transcends that stuff. But mm-hmm. Inevitably, cut, since it's who I am, it, it bled into Yeah, it. you can get caught up with that too, and you, especially as a singer. Anybody can <clears throat> cut up, oh, I hate that little thing in my voice, or I hate, you know, I'm not yeah. doing this technically right or whatever, but but even that is weird because sometimes the best, and I shouldn't say best, see, there's that thing again, but like, yeah. um, some of your favorite singers are not doing it right, you know, but like the the intricacies of their of their voice or whatever is what you love. Like it does it's like it shouldn't be perfect. Like if somebody sang perfectly, it would be probably like an opera singer or something, right? Like they're yeah. doing it all perfectly, but that doesn't mean that you're gonna connect with it or the song, even if it's technically perfect. That's just weird, man. Looking out from within, you just see what is. Hmm. So like you can go like Bob Dylan. Some people love him, some people hate him, but he's cool because he is what it is. And then mm-hmm. a lot of times you see somebody's, pers- you know, the confidence they show, and then you just accept it for what it is, love it or hate it, think it's good or bad, or in the middle. But I think at least my, my all my struggles tended to be rooted in what I fe- where I felt like I could be or should be. Mm-hmm. So like I was never really accepting where I was. It was mm-hmm. always like, yeah, but I, I mean, I know. You know, I know when my time fluctuates a little bit and I just like shame myself for it. Right. And it's obvious, and then, right? That's it's more obvious when it's a technical thing. You're like, oh, I, I can. That's true. Yeah. Same with like singing. Like, oh, I knew that note was a little flat or a little sharp. Mm-hmm. And when you know that's happening, it's, it's much different because it's like a goal you know you could reach and you didn't. But when people just hear you doing something, they just go, yeah, that's the guy who plays like that with mm-hmm. this level of imperfection and they just sort of right. accept it and maybe, you know, 
few people care as much, I think, about perfection than the as people you do. as you do. Yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely a weird. What do you think about that? Trick. What do you what do you, what do you think the role of just pure blind confidence plays in, especially singing, but playing one of you, like your own songs in front of people? Oh man, two big things come up when you say that. I think I have a th- theory. I don't even know if it raises to the level of theory. It's more of just a thought that manifests as a finger. As a twiddling finger. Um, I have a theory that a lot of the people who are the most successful in any field have some sort of personality <laughs> at, at, at minimum quirk, but I think at maximum like an actual personality disorder, like egomania yeah, or yeah. narcissism. Yeah. So that their confidence is so high that they, they're impervious to criticism. Right. Is that and a good I, thing? I think it's a thing that is a hallmark of successful people. Mm-hmm. I think... T- so in it's the good ex- in that sense. It's good in the sense of being su- being su- successful. If that's all that matters, yeah. But maybe not pers- interpersonally or <laughs> the way you deal with other people or whatever. I feel like success, first of all, you have to define it. <clears throat> There's a million ways to define success, but it's at least... It's below, um, I think, people or relationships. So... If you get success by stepping on other people Mm. in whatever way that is, then why are you stepping on people? And I think in the cases of super successful people, I think it's that money is more important than relationships. So get out of my way. Mm -hmm. You're either with me or you're against me. Mm -hmm. Or there's (laughs) there's that competitive side of like, I think a really egomaniac, narcissistic person is like everybody is a competitor and everybody's either an, en- mm-hmm. an enemy or an ally. And that kind of single-minded thinking and the confidence it gives you, like the traits of, of narcissism have to do with, you know, like I, it's like, isn't it like a Greek god, narcissist or nars, whatever. Narcissus. Narcissus. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's but it's woman, about like looking, course. looking into the lake and like seeing your own reflection and yeah, going yeah. like, Oh, there's nothing better than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so, like you know, I think instantly of Kanye West when I think of an, a successful right. Pure person confidence. with narcissist, narcissism or narcissistic traits. Yeah. But what that does is just, you know, if, whoever doesn't like me is an idiot, right? Or stupid. So it's a good thing. Or they don't they don't get it. Whatever it is, <clears throat> and whoever likes me is cool. It doesn't yeah. ever slow you down. It never because I, I I have the opposite. I have like zero <laughs> self esteem, but you know, it's, and it stops me sometimes from doing things. Just too much judging going on of of myself, and I and I always think that like I wish I could just be that guy. I wish I could just be Kanye West, and just do you not? Yeah, totally. Well, Why? I wouldn't. I wish I could turn it on and turn it off. I guess because I wouldn't want to live in that. I don't want to drive around, be one of those people that's on the freeway that everyone mm-hmm. else is an idiot because they're not driving how you want them to drive. You ever notice that? Yeah. People get the road rage thing and it's like instantly people will just call other people idiots right away. Yeah. <clears throat> I've seen everybody I know that's a crazy driver. That's the first thing they do is like, what is this idiot doing? Like, move, idiot. Every, everybody's stupid. It's like, they're not stupid. They're just trying to drive on the same road yeah, as you. Yeah, they're not it's people. Not they're just a, a thing in a car. Yeah. They're just a car. Uh, well, here's the thing is like, you say like, I wish I could turn it off, turn it on. That's almost like if you're able to turn it on, I guess at the highest level, that means you're just in that zone or what do they call that? Um, they call it the zone, but it's also like a flow state. Mm-hmm. That's when you're the most confident, when you're just, there's mm-hmm. no insecurity, there's no part of yourself watching what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And that's that's ultimate confidence that's not rooted in ego, I think is when you're just everything right. that you are and you're just doing it. That's true. And that I think you can learn to turn off, turn yeah. on and off to some degree, or For turn sure. off. You can learn to turn it on, but I just think that those, those people that have that trait, it's just, it's for some reason who they are. Maybe not enough hugs when they were a kid, sure. or whatever it was that makes them just, I'm going to prove myself to the whole world, and I'm great no matter what anybody thinks. I, you know, and I think it's in like psychological attachment theory and stuff. There's some sort of injury mm-hmm. when they were a kid, when they needed acceptance, they didn't get it or something happened. But it works. But it, it, people, <clears throat> people use it. I mean, look at 
we just said we weren't going to talk about politics, but I mean, that's that's our, the president that we have. Like that's what I see is just uber confidence, right? So much so that it's like delusional. Yeah, like I don't even care what anybody. Why would I care what anybody thinks? It's that yeah. combined too with with the posturing and the mm-hmm. the false confidence that maybe a really high level negotiator needs to have, mm-hmm. like the willingness to just walk away. But I watch people like that, and I, I always think like. Do they, are they thinking in the back of their head? Are they questioning? They're probably not, but if it was me, I would be like. Yeah, and no I've heard how, stories about Trump being a pretty different guy one-on-one. Mm-hmm. So you, I just wonder how much of it's an act. I think for sure he, that he's got a lot of narcissistic, narcissistic ego sure. traits. But it's also an act. I mean, he's a, he's a TV star. Yeah. You know, you have to know how to turn it on if you're going to be the star of a TV show. And at that level of success too, there's a basic... <laughs> level of iq that goes along with it and iq is sure. like it's it's uh it's fluid intelligence so like mm-hmm. it's intelligence that goes everywhere mm-hmm. you know what i mean it's like relational street smarts it's mm-hmm. you know mathematical intelligence spatial yeah dealing with people interpersonal dealing with people stuff. like all that stuff so i think i think people don't give him enough credit for that part that he's actually yeah. really smart but i think he puts it to use in a lot of manipulative ways which and and you know whatever willing to lie will, whatever it is that sure. that he does pander i don't really yeah i don't really pay attention <laughs> but everybody else here's the thing too much attention <laughs> yeah stop watching the news people I just know that <laughs> I got enough to handle in my immediate circle about I know, 3 feet around I me. I don't need any more chaos, you know. I know that's horrible. My dad was telling me last night that I better go out and vote on Tuesday. Yeah. And right when he said it, I was like, "But I I don't vote." <laughs> like I just feel like this is totally a cop out, but I just sort of feel like I don't know enough about both sides of anything. To, to make to one make, vote. To that's the thing. It's like black and white. Yes. When you vote, there's no, well, I can kind of give you 50% of my my ideas. And the, you know, because that's how I, there's, I always see both sides of things. Or I try gray. to. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, everything is gray to me in, in hopefully in a good way. Sometimes it's annoying in my own brain. But yeah, when you're voting, we're, we're telling people not to vote. <laughs> uh, that's what you're doing, though. You're, you're making a definitive 100%. It's kind of that personality thing that we were just talking about. Someone that's completely confident. Like, I yep. know 100%. This is my black and white vote. Bam. And not all issues are black and white. And maybe there are issues that are like, obviously that's, you yeah. know, the majority of people can see like, oh, well, that's a bad idea that pol- politicians are trying to whatever, or pull the wool over in your eyes. Like, mm-hmm. we should all get up and vote for that thing. So I know there are those, those issues. I don't want to like paint it with one brush, sure. but it does feel like that though, that like, you hear so much about laws that are passed and the headline is this, but then in the fine print, you're actually voting for the opposite thing you thought you were, or they're sneaking some other policy in with that one. And I just feel like that aspect of it, it's like, I'm not informed enough to make that kind of like, yeah. Well, even if you are, yeah, my, my thing is this, every time I've ever voted, I've always regretted who I voted. Not always, but most of the time. Really? Yeah, because if you're voting for a person, you you know everybody says they're going to do a certain thing, and then they might not be able to do it because it's too hard to do it once you get in the office, or yeah. or they just don't, or they change something, and then you're like, I voted for you, and now you're not doing what I was hoping. So it's like, well, <laughs> you can't control someone just because you vote for them, you know. I sent you a text the other day, and you said yes, we can, and then I responded with the <laughs> Obama picture that says yes, we can, and I look at that, and I'm like, yeah, what? Yeah. Yes, we can. What? What was he even talking about? I always, I th- always thought it was like, yes, we can have a president that's who's black, black. <laughs> <laughs> which is Maybe true. That we was could. It. Well, I think that was probably the bigger message, and it was, was it? amazing. Like I, I don't yeah, know I mean, that was a that was a brilliant year. marketing campaign because he's so presidential. Yeah. The dude's undeniably, and it was a big thing. I remember watching the inauguration, and he came out with his family, and yeah. watching a black president come out. I was, I teared up. I was like, wow, this is a story. Everybody felt like it was a historical moment. Yeah. Love him, hate him, somewhere in the middle. I mean, I think it'd be cool if he was on a, um, some money. If he what? I don't know. Oh, if he was on money. Yeah, like I don't know yeah. what, I don't know what money. Totally. Maybe invent like a $75 bill and <laughs> put Obama on it. 
We do need to do that, though. We need to update the pictures, I think. I know, money. they are getting a little old. Maybe Wasn't who, there a recent one? Was who should like be a, on Bitcoin? Trump? <laughs> <laughs> Digital? That's when we can swap out easily, is Bitcoin. Yeah, that's right. We could change the, change the image. But that's worldwide money, so it would need to be a worldwide leader. Oh, right. So you can't put God on Bitcoin. That's a little too much. A little heavy-handed. Yeah, and how do we vote for which God? I don't know. Well, here's the thing. Back to the the you're not confident thing. I've never... Me personally or just... You personally. Oh, right. Like this is a personal attack on you. Bring it on. <laughs> I'm attacking you with an encouragement or something. Like A I, love bomb? A love bomb. <laughs> so that... Like, I've never experienced, I don't, ex- okay, you're an enigma, that's what it is. Wrapped in a I've never, tortilla. <laughs> yeah, wrapped in a tortilla <laughs> with black beans. Um, you're just, I don't experience you as somebody who is not confident. Good. In fact, the opposite. Good. But, shoot, I don't want to. Bring it on, because I, I, I feel like I definitely don't show it, you know. So you're a good Maybe actor. I pro- oh, I've learned. You should be confident in your acting skills oh, then. Maybe, maybe that's the thing. I, for me personally, I've always been really shy. I was shy growing up and just withdrawn. and Introverted? Or I picked on for being like the skinny kid. And so then I played guitar and it was like, oh, that made me like cool with people in high school and whatever. That was the mm. one thing I had. But other than that, you know, so I just had to learn. And this was just through like, you know, random crappy job after a crappy job just having to deal with people that are like kind of bullyish and you know what i mean i've had to learn how to do it it doesn't mm. it's not natural for me interesting but i think i think maybe maybe your confidence is like in that you it's somewhere rooted maybe in intelligence or something you just kind of like well i know what i th- maybe i know <laughs> i think i suck and you can't convince me otherwise <laughs> and i'm confident about it <laughs> Maybe that's the confidence. So I think that's called humility, right? Confidence that you're not great is humility if it's not total insecurity. I don't know. That's quite a definition. I don't know. It, <laughs> it pretty, doesn't sound right. Pretty clinical. I'll I'll say yes. Yes, that's what it yeah. is. What about you? Do you feel con- or I don't know how to ask that question. How, how do you feel? Well, okay, when are you when do you feel the most confident when you're doing musical Ooh. some anything creative like when is it back to that whole flow state thing where you just try to be in the moment and you get rid of yourself uh, yeah well that's like in hindsight i go <clears> wow <throat> that's that's when i was the most confident because when i can look back and go i was clearly in a flow state because six hours just went by and it felt yeah. like nothing or i was you know and that's one of the hallmarks of a flow state i think yeah. but then also Time. when i look at what re- the results of that and that's part of why i love you know, recording music and making music because yeah. it's a document right. of something. Um, but it's very easy to go to to look at, oh, here's what was created when I didn't even remember what I was creating, so which is cool. a definite thing. Like I, so many, I have a really bad memory anyway, but the songs I think that I feel were the most, um, hit the target, I guess, mm-hmm. for myself the most were the ones where I'm like, I don't, it's almost like I didn't even do that. I don't remember how that happened, and I don't mm. know how to play it, so that sucks because I could never play this live. <laughs> I have to go back and learn it. Um, but I can see like, oh, I'm, there's sort of a feeling about that that's a little elevated above something that you put a lot of thought into, and there was a lot of right. questioning and going back and forth, which tends for me to happen more in the realm of like business and when I'm getting hired to do something because you inevitably yeah. are going after a target that's not really of your creation. So right. you're kind of like, specific. you have to remember like, oh, what are they looking for? And then there's a certain amount of insecurity in that mixed with the confidence that, oh, maybe I can hit that target for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that would be when I feel the most confident. But then there's also a certain amount of confidence that comes just, I guess, from preparation or having done something so much. Mm -hmm. But whenever I feel like I'm being put on the uh, chopping block or... Here's a good uh, good example is like mixing or something. Like, I know how I like like things to sound. And I'm... Big and fat. (laughs) It's been my... (laughs) It's been like my... uh, 
a big part of my career has been doing a lot of different genres and whatever mm -hmm. and trying to understand what makes each genre, subgenre, or even each artist mm -hmm. special and what they see as a... I feel like every genre has an object, like a subjective... Uh, a bunch of rules wrapped up into it that are mm -hmm. sort of stylistic and yeah. they're subjective, but the people who are in it think it's objective. Mm. There's like this accepted sense of like, this is what's good, this is what's cool, this is what's acceptable, and if you venture outside that, you're now becoming this other thing that's not part of our little club. Right, right. Whether it's hip hop or rock or pop or alternative or I, I think the more esoteric and hipster you get, the more rules there are. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of made it my goal to figure out, like almost deconstruct that. And then when you're in the process of doing it, you like, you, you try to understand it and allow that to be your set of rules. Hmm. So when I'm mixing, to get back to the point of all that, like I make it sound how I think it should sound. Like this is, how, this is what I like. And then the moment it comes time for somebody to hear it, I'm like, man, it is so easy to pick out any part of this mix and go, what? Hmm. And have a case. And if they're in their little, obje their supposed objective box, right. I'm wrong. So mm. like, and since my identity is wrapped up in what I do, when they say, I even said it just now, I'm wrong, which really it's not just like, that's not what I wanted. But that's how it feels. But it put, that's how it feels. Yeah. And that's inside take what I, everything I do so personally and it's it's so important to me I can get I'm easily like oh I can get defensive like mm -hmm. you're they they might be talking about the snare drum I feel like they're talking about me <laughs> and my worth as a person yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I feel so that's when I'm the least confident is like interesting when I know that there's this subjective line that mm -hmm. could be perceived as objective and it's like and I've made a decision you're putting yourself out there. And I think that's the hardest thing about, about music is the more personal it is mm -hmm. and the more, more it hurts, the more it hurts <laughs> when you put yourself out there and people don't get it or they judge it or whatever it is. It's just yeah. like, I feel like they don't get me and they're judging me. Oh, totally. I've been there for sure. But that's better. It's better that it's a piece of work, I guess, because there are other songs and I can write more new right. ones. Right. Yeah. But that, that's funny too, because doesn't it always feel, I don't know, maybe not for you, but always feels like when I write a song or record a song or finish something, I feel like like there's a lot of stake in just that one, but like you said, it's just one song. Yeah. But I always feel like this is so important that this one piece of music... Um, well, there's only one like, right now, and that's the... Th right? Maybe that's what it is. Like, it's just in your brain to just think, this is the most important thing right now, because it is right now, or whatever. Yeah, and it's supposed to be... I mean... There's this implicit idea that the thing that you've done, like you're only as good as your last song, kind of. Yeah, that thing. Because like I'll, I don't want to come out with a record that I know deep down, like my new record, if I'm working on it or something, and this is actually one of the hallmarks of whether or not I am ready to make a, put out a record or start putting the final touches on a record. Mm -hmm. It's like I have to feel like I've gone forward. Yeah. And I think there are times where I'll be like, yeah, I have enough songs for a record. But I'll be like, if I put those songs out, I feel like one of my past records might be actually a better record. Like, mm. and that's and that can be like a thought I have that makes me go, I need more songs. I need to keep writing. Yeah, because like there's something, even though I'm proud of all these, when you put them all together, it doesn't have as much weight as some mm -hmm. of my last stuff or something. So then I'll just keep. Go I'll just go. Ah, I'm not ready. Have you done? How many times have you done that? Where you have like a batch of songs that's going to be the record, and then you feel like it's missing one thing, and then you write a song for that thing. You ever done that? Yeah. Like well, to finish a record, yeah, I need this one to start the record, or I need something that does this in the in the batch. I think it's that does this because this this past record was like that. I was like, what was the song? There were. It was two. There were two songs. No, three. Like I w I had enough songs to have the record. I always overwrite. I write more than I need, but there was definitely a feeling that the record would have been out of balance if I didn't... If there's a certain kind of like... I don't know, there's some kind of recipe I have for when I feel like I have an album. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with sort of going through a period in my life 
and kind of hitting all the things that I am or something. Oh, right. So it's more, it's more um, autobiographical almost. Yeah. It's like this, here's a picture of, of my life and I've kind of hit, I've hit a real low. I've hit a real high. I've hit a real yeah. confusion state. I've hit, I've hit a real kind of transcendent state or I've been in a place of, uh, of contemplating the larger things in life. I've been super mm-hmm. focused on a small thing. I've been through a crisis. Like I, th- I never really thought about it that way, but I think that's sort of it. And, and you feel like that the record has to have that. Yeah. yeah. Or, and I feel, cause I feel like that's kind of what a, <clears throat> the only reason to make a record is to have like a, man. The only reason here it comes. <laughs> here, I know. <laughs> Everyone right? listen. I just caught myself <laughs> being Mr. <laughs> you stopped too. <laughs> I did. That's why. But that's Silence. My, Everybody be quiet. We're going to hear. The only reason <laughs> to make a record. Go. Is to make a record. Ah, oh, that's kind of a letdown. Zen. Now, my idea, <laughs> of my personal idea of like what a great record is for a solo artist mm-hmm. is one that really captures that person at that time. At the time, yeah. So like honest totally. and like, otherwise, why not just release single after single after single there's a reason why mm-hmm. you're putting it together especially now when you can when you don't have to when have you don't a have to yeah so for me the justification for having a record is to have a batch of songs that work together but weren't contrived as one thing these aren't like oh cool these aren't like uh, a new, like a concept it's not a concept one album. giant song or whatever yeah because then the the tail's wagging the dog you're like oh i'm this is a rock opera mm-hmm. i need the the third act you know right, right, right. but in an emotional, psychological sense, or emotional, intellectual, psychological, all that stuff, spiritual, that here's what happened: is I got, th- I felt like I had a bunch of songs, and then I had like eight songs that I was really okay. These are going on the record, and I felt like I hadn't hit that um, reflective mm. thing. So basically, what happened is I wrote a song, this, the title track, "When a Heart Wakes Up," and that one kind of hit that target of and it, it's funny because I it wasn't created because I needed it but it it came out and I'm like oh this is what was kind of missing and mm-hmm. then I'm like but now that with these other songs mm-hmm. feels out of balance and then I kept thinking about like I hadn't really found a musical place mm-hmm. for my spiritual journey i guess i hadn't really written about that and and i had it in my head i don't know anyway so i wrote the the song back to earth which is another um yeah. kind of solo acoustic thing i guess that too there wasn't like a an intimate moment yet on the record so okay. back to earth and when a heart wakes up were the two moments it's like one of my favorite things to do is just mainly guitar and vocal mm-hmm Totally vulnerable. Just totally vulnerable, boom. naked, and just where, and the songs. It's so scary. It's meant to be that. <laughs> that's your favorite. Oh yeah, my favorite. That's my favorite thing to perform too. It's just. I'll solo. say it's one of my favorite things to hear when you, when your favorite artist puts out a song like that. It's just totally stripped down. Mm. I think every and the, yeah. I, I think everybody would, would not everybody would agree, but most ah, people. You did it. Did I make a blanket statement? <laughs> No, but you know, like <clears throat> it's pretty universally accepted that yeah. if someone sits, if one guy or one girl sits down at a piano or, or with the guitar and sings, anybody, even if you don't like that genre of music, is like, well, something special is happening because there's nothing to hide behind. Yeah, that's the most scary. And singing is the most vulnerable thing. You know, people are people say public speaking is like the number one fear. Mm. Try public singing. <laughs> it's like oh, you're just it's adding crazy. all these layers of like you, you're thinking about how you sound, you're thinking about the room, you're thinking about your voice, you're thinking about how you. If you're doing so it wrong, scary. that's what you're thinking about. Yeah, right, right. You shouldn't be thinking about any of that. Stuff. No, but that's yeah. the stuff that you are basically forced to th- get over thinking about because <laughs> you. I don't yeah. know. At least maybe people who aren't just those kind of singer who just like <laughs> they open their mouth and it comes out perfect. Yeah. But that's rare. I was going to say something about that too. You're talking about you. Your favorite thing is those no. kind of songs. Yeah, and and I think that stems from the fact that I, I started singing late. I think for a, at least for a, by singer standards, like mm-hmm. I didn't really start singing and saying like I am singing until mm-hmm. I was like 19. 
Is that late? I guess that's late. I don't know. I mean, I talk... The singers I work with that are great, and like, doing oh, wow, kids, you're amazing. Right? It's like, oh, yeah, I, could, I was singing before that's I true. could talk. You know, like, yeah, it, there's true. that every time. Usually it's girls. Too, I was just going to say, it's usually girls, right? Yeah. yeah. They're two or three years old. They were singing. Yeah. Um, it is. It does seem to be more rare. With is that why girls guys. are better singers than guys? <laughs> <Maybe> so. <laughs> just the time period. <clears throat> they don't have Adam's apples either. I think that's some. there's something physical going on. Yeah, there's definitely... We have more there's, junk in there. There's yeah, like there's all this weight. stuff that gets in the way. Even to, even talking, like I can feel my throat. Whoa, whoa. I'm always trying to not feel my throat work. Yeah, trying you're quite an apple. That. Well, I got a lot to get around. I should have one. It is my namesake. <laughs> Corey Apple. That's what they call it. No, but I think that starting late and not being a technically gifted singer, but I felt like... What drew me to singing was like, ooh, that's going to be an avenue for expression. Like it was really like yeah. when I sang and when I went to write something, I like really knew how I wanted it to be. Like mm-hmm. how I wanted my voice to sound. I wanted to sing the word, like what the melody was and how. I think that's how your voice comes across too, if I can, as a, as a fan. Oh, wow. <clears throat> it's like all emotion. Not, I shouldn't say all emotion, but it's very like visceral mm. the way you sing. My wife said you have a, uh, she loves your voice. She said, what, is she, what was it? She coined the tragically beautiful. That's what <laughs> she always says about it. And I was like, yeah, it's that was kind a of good perfect. Compliment. It definitely, I mean, I can't really speak to that other than it's like a, the need is so intense. Mm-hmm. I feel like they're, and maybe this is kind of for all artists that really feel like they have to do it. Is it, for me, it's like there, there are things that, that are going on inside of me that can only come out when I sing. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's like a life raft. Mm-hmm. It's like that's the thing mm-hmm. or it's a rope. I'm down in a tunnel and the rope out to light is like, I have to sing this. What does that mean? it's not going to come out. I've heard you say that before. What, do you, what does that actually mean? Do you mean like the feeling of doing it or just the feeling of getting an I- idea out or something? It's funny. I only asked it's that funny. because I made an I made an art piece called Intermittent Isolation Syndrome. It's like kind of, it was like half kidding. IIS, yeah. But I have IIS. But it's like IBS. But it's a I feel, yeah. <laughs> It's equally painful <laughs> and crappy. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, thanks. Good pun. First pun of the podcast, people. <laughs> it it cures the isolation for a second. Because yeah. it's like, While here's a bunch it. of stuff that I can't somehow connect with somebody on or express. And <clears throat> mm-hmm. if I write a song and sing it, then I feel like it's like, th- that's the therapeutic aspect of it. Mm-hmm. So, so much comes out and I feel like, oh, this is, this is the only way to do it. And then the other thing was, from a technical sense too, like I've spent my whole singing started at, the, it was... <laughs> it's like recording my singing was always the point right so you so i've always sung with headphones on with my vocal really loud yeah and every nuance counted interesting and i've noticed throughout my career the people who are more like the tour a ton Mm -hmm. and maybe their basic uh premise for being a singer songwriter is to perform yeah often there's this whole the first 10% of nuance in their vocal is ignored because they're always doing it live. To. So yeah. if they sing a note and end the, like uh, that little bit that nobody's ever going to hear at a club or a, or a show, right. he all gets picked up in the mic. They don't really use that part of their voice. And for me, like I was always yeah. like, Ooh, it's all about that little stuff. Like it really is the, with recording where the S is placed and how the S sounds and, all those little nuances are what makes things either really special and honest or whatever. It's like vocabulary. It's like there's, yeah. if you're using that level of nuance, you just have more words. Yeah. More to textural. express what you're yeah. trying to express. Totally. I'm, I'm actually the opposite. I'm, <clears throat> I spent all my time learning to sing, doing it live, and then went to record. I, mean, I, I, do, I remember like the first time I was like really singing, singing in a recording studio. It was yeah. terrifying. I was actually singing harmony. Like the first time I ever put headphones on and with like a good mic and a compressor. Yeah. And it just sounded so weird to me because it was all right there. And you hear every little P 
titchy whatever. And I just remember going, I can't do this. This is so <laughs> weird. But I think I also think that's the best thing for us for any, especially that kind of a singer that sings live a lot, mm -hmm. is just start recording yourself, even if you don't ever show anybody, because you know, like you're saying, you you hear every little thing and you get. It's the best way to get rid of your bad habits because another problem with the live live singers, you know, is you just get these weirdly really weird habits, mm -hmm. and you can you can you can hear it. In, in certain singers, like that's true. The way they trail off, or they they always do this one little thing, and it's just they don't notice it because you have a band behind you when you're playing live, and there's a room, and there's there's energy from the crowd. You don't think about it. And there are pluses and minuses. Habits. Yeah, and there are pluses and minuses <clears throat> to that sort of regimen because you need to be able to sing every night. So there are things like yeah. I find that those singers end up being like rock solid, mm -hmm. like. From the first take, you're getting stuff that's at least a B plus, mm. because you know, like they're usually really solid, and you can tell that they're just they're, they're in shape as right. a singer. They're used basically. to just stepping up to the mic and just belting. Yeah, but you need to get you need to pull out that like, no, I I want every take to be different, and special, yeah. and like sing it half as loud and sing it, you mm -hmm. know, come at it from a different angle. Like, you know, they're used to making sure that there's a certain amount of projection, right? But then, but also there's those other things that can reveal yeah. whatever that first 10% of nuance is, there could be a bunch of problems there. Mm -hmm. Or there could be a bunch of potential. Yeah. Or whatever, you don't know. Or for me, like, it's just stuff you don't want to hear. And you hear yourself <laughs> back and you're like, oh, why am I doing that thing? Yeah. And then you go, oh, I've been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And then you go, but, but it's a great way to, like I say, like I, every, and it's so easy to record yourself on a whatever. On your computer, mm -hmm. I think every every singer should spend time. I, that's how I like tune up my voice too. Like when we were um, whatever band I was in, like if we went to a recording, yeah, uh, it was like a vocal day or whatever. I would spend time at home just singing into the mic and just with checking. headphones on. Yeah, or just recording, recording stuff yeah. just to kind of check, you know. All you non-singers out there have already tuned out. Huh? <laughs> no, yeah, that's a good. It's funny. I've never done. I never tried that. Well, I've never. I've done very little touring, so I want to do that. Honestly, that I would always do that before we had we had to do like a vocal session or whatever that I felt was important. Or I I do these cover gigs. You know, yeah, do like three hour long gigs, just an acoustic guitar and vocal. I just do covers and you know, corporate stuff and mm -hmm. private parties and stuff. But that is the best way to get your voice in shape because you first of all you're just singing other people's songs. And then you're singing for three hours. Yeah. Every time I do that, I walk away just like it's just so much, so effortless to sing after wow. those kind of gigs. Yeah. So I, there was a time when uh, my old band Ages, we were recording uh, with a big producer, and and before we did vocal day, I was like booking. I was just trying to book those kind of gigs just to kind of like get my chops up. Mm -hmm. Totally works. I remember hearing Stuart Copeland talk about that with like he always wished they would go record a Police album. Right when they got off tour, yeah, that's and he's like, thing, yeah. I always feel like basically every Police record is like me, like not in shape as a drummer, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, and it's a different environment too. If you just sit down in a studio, if you're used to being out playing live, mm -hmm. playing clubs or whatever, it's just, it's a little bit less comfortable, probably. Yeah, it's true. Singing's weird, man. When your voice is in your body, yeah, it's just that's what makes it so great, though. When you right. Feel because you you can't help but feel it. You can't help but feel what you're singing or the song. Yeah. <clears throat> One thing that really it's always annoyed me. I've had been in a bunch of bands throughout my life, and then had my own bands and whatever. And I have a lot of musician friends that are they're just players, you know, mm -hmm. working on their craft. They're just drummers. They're just a bass player. I'm just a guitar player, whatever. Guys that don't sing, it just drives me crazy. It's like because don't you do, do you think everybody can sing? You think it's like anybody can do it? Oh, man. I don't mean be a great singer. I everybody just mean can everybody make a can sound. Sing. Well, not everybody, but most people can make. Yeah. What do you th What do you mean? Like, is tone deaf real? I just yeah. I mean, anybody that doesn't sing always says I can't sing. But then you hear people say like anybody can do it. If you can talk, you can sing. Basically, it doesn't mean you're going to sound great. Or whatever. Yeah. I only bring that up because I I know a lot of musicians that are like no I don't I don't sing I just play my instrument. It's like hey, dude, right. you have to learn how to you have to do it. It's true. It not only makes you it makes you a better musician too, because yep. you can if you can sing the notes that you're hearing that you can play, it's all kind of one thing. You know what? I think the world would be a better place if everybody worked on singing a little 
and everybody learned how to play a, a little bit of drums. Drums. <laughs> Why drums? I didn't see that coming. I'm just, I'm just, just hit I'm laying this down, man. This is my objective, subjective idea is that I'm completely biased because I'm, I'm a drummer first. Right. But I feel like if you, here's a, here's a couple reasons. One, like what you were just saying, like everybody can sing. And if you can't, there's something going on. Like I've heard that tone deafness is actually a myth and that it's actually just oh, really? fear. Mm-hmm. Um, which I don't I don't believe because I think of course there's so many different kinds of people with so many different kinds of mental issues that are small and big. So yeah, there's probably some people who can't distinguish pitch enough to know the difference between two notes. For sure. Whatever. There's got to yeah. be that out sure. there. Sure. But it's yeah. probably pretty rare. Yeah. But that <clears throat> vocal your vocal apparatus is one of the things that like is probably the it it's so reactive to emotion. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, try having a basic normal conversation if you're really crying or like, it responds to emotion because that's how we relate. Right. And and what is, and fear is such a powerful emotion. Yeah. It's going to just close your your throat up. Yeah. We've all, (laughs) like when you're a little kid and you like wake up from a bad dream and try to scream for your mom and only air comes out. Has that ever happened to you? No, I don't have bad dreams. Mom! (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Maybe it's just me. I think it's just you. But yeah, and then, and that's the problem with, here's total sidebar, but pop singing gets a bad rap in the world of like professional, maybe opera singing or Broadway, or when you hear somebody who's trained as an opera or Broadway singer, they tend to be weird pop singer. Yeah. Um, But pop singers tend to have a lot of vocal issues. And I think it's because pop singing is more closely related to speech Mm. and we put on a pedestal emotional expression over anything else whereas in these other disciplines it's about having a strong voice that can survive or that can project mm-hmm. without a mic or um diction's really important being understood and so the training builds you up into this thing that's like you're a very powerful voice and other things are more are very important let's say or come first <clears throat> or come first yeah or just higher up on the hierarchy i guess of importance but a pop singer it's like you think about a great rock singer and it's like if if you're singing an intensely emotional song that's angry and you embody that in your voice chances are that's not hurt. something you can sustain yeah. night after night after night after night and that's why pop singers are prone to n- nodules and mm-hmm. vocal issues is because i mean if you're going to if you're going to get into those kinds of emotions and really right. express them, they're not healthy for your voice, yeah. but they're, it's healthy for your art in a sense that it's honest. Right. So anyways, that's, <clears throat> I've struggled with that because I think there are things that, um, and there are voices that, that people, millions and millions of people love and it's a flawed um, technique. Technique, yeah. You'll hear lots of, like Adele, I remember when, She's considered to be a great singer, but she got nodes. Mm-hmm. And from going to vocal lessons, and I've been scoped at the doctor for. Oh, really? You know, I was afraid I had nodes at one point or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I kind of learned some of the things that you can hear in a voice that's that sounds great, but is actually really unhealthy singing. And one of the things mm-hmm. is <clears throat> there's a vocal instructor named Ron Anderson. His vocal lessons are astronomical amount of money per hour and he's you know taught a bunch of amazing singers and one of the worst things you can do is like sing on your vocal cords is that when you can you kind of feel you can feel that the vibration Mm -hmm. is happening on the cords and what you really want which is this comes from classical is to resonate in your head like you want to you want to push the tone forward they call it like in the mask Yeah. yeah but when you're singing on your cords um I think Adele, early Adele, um, Gavin DeGraw is another one that comes to mind. These are got, their tone is really rooted in this. This thing's like ah, it's like yeah. down on there. And so I remember going, man, we're rabbit trailing, but I remember going to Ron Anderson and showing him the recording of my song uh, "Invisible Enemies." Yeah, during and the he fallborn years, and he's listening to the verse, and this is his first time hearing me, and I'm sitting there with him next to the piano. 
awkwardly watching. Yeah. And he's like on the board of the Metropolitan Opera, but he's like giving lessons to Chris Cornell and yeah. Adam Levine and all these people. And um, actually after my lesson, Anthony Kiedis walked in. He was like the next Whoa. lesson. <laughs> and and uh, he's hearing the verse and it's like kind of in a lower register. He's like, mm, mm, oh, very nice. It's a, it's a very nice instrument. <laughs> he said that. He said that. I was like, oh, this is going really well. So cool. And then right when the chorus kicked in, he went, no, 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 no. Turn it off. <laughs> yeah. I can't hear it. He's like, invisible in a maze. Yeah, I know what you're talking, I know the sound you're talking about yeah. from that song. And when I hit that. It sounds like it's like maze. distorting your chords or something. Yeah. And it's like a sound that I liked. Yeah. But, and here's the thing. Every time I sang that song live, by the last chorus, Done. which has visible enemies, I don't want to future full of fear. Oh, you went high. I remember, like, I would never last. Like, I was always done. My voice was like, oh my gosh, this is not going to hold up. And I never really knew why. And he goes, you're singing right on your chords. He's like, you're, you have a few years left of vocal life. If you can sing oh. like <laughs> yeah, you went dark on me, man. How much do you like this song? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is it worth being your last song, you sing? dude and it was a bummer too because yeah that immediately is you know put me talk about the like your values wrapped up in what you do right it's like shoot man how do i get rid of that so then <laughs> then we start going through vocal exercises and he it was an interesting experience because i didn't what we were doing didn't make sense to me and it like I felt like he kind of went into just, here's what I do with everybody mode. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it wasn't customized to me. So I felt a little bit like in in the situation, I was just like, I was kind of caught up in like, oh shoot, what's going on? And this doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. Which of course, I think it was a little bit of my, this tear between like, well, maybe you're asking me to do something that's going to turn me into something I'm not. Right, yeah. Mixed with, can I even do it? Mm -hmm. And whatever so i don't know i don't and the know. second you well that going back to what we were talking about earlier like the second you get up in your head when you're singing it's done like you start thinking about it and then then you have a then you then your thought produces an emotion whether it's fear or Eek. yeah you're a little get a little shy about it and then you instantly your voice is the next thing that's affected shoot that's an interesting topic too um <clears throat> that's the but that's the only well i guess every instrument you could you could be held back if you're <clears throat> overthinking it or whatever but especially your voice because you it's you can't even control it but dude here okay so this is a good question for each other i didn't even answer the original question what was the question it doesn't matter confidence confidence Same thing. if you have 100 percent confidence yeah. when you're singing you're going to be it doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect singer but it means you're going to be way better off then the, the second you start down i only know that because i'm a big self-doubter in myself so mm -hmm. i had to especially like touring a lot, I had to just learn how to just turn it off and just fake, you just at least fake it. Like, I am great. I'm going to sound great. Rah! At least it gets rid of the thing that's, that pulls you back, you know, any yeah. sort of like negative emotion or any, any self-doubt or whatever. The second you start doubting your voice, you're going to, it's going to choke up. How many times have you, sing, have you seen that with singers that come in and you're producing and they, you, they may not be comfortable right away and, you gotta like, you're just trying to get them comfortable so that they can sing. Yeah. Because if you're not comfortable, you're not gonna be able to sing. Yeah, it's one of the most delicate things. I've even had, I've even noticed my voice, like act, my throat actually drying up when I get too nervous. Oh yeah, I've gotten that so a couple many times. times. And you're like, wait a minute. And then you're just drinking water and nothing, not, does, nothing helps. Right. Because the water, you did it to yourself. <laughs> water's a weird myth because it doesn't <clears throat> even, unless it's actually just like dripping down Vo when you swallow wow. water, it doesn't even get close to your vocal cords. Right. But I guess, I've always heard that if you're... If it did, it'd be going down your lungs. You're supposed to drink while you're singing, I think. You need an IV. That's called gargling. <laughs> oh, it sounds a little worse. <clears throat> Chris Carn told me one time, he's like, if you... I mean, the mucus you, goes down. So if you're dehydrated and you hydrate, you make more mucus and that... I guess. Lubricates your cords. But you have a little flap in there that covers your vocal cords when you swallow water. Oh, right. oh, okay. I didn't know Unless that. you gargle, because then the water is bouncing off your vocal yeah, yeah. cords. So gargling is good. I guess singing. gargling is good. But I think the the main thing is you want to be hydrated. I was uh, Chris Carn told me one time. He's like, people that walk around, singers that walk around drinking 
j- big jugs of water, which I've I've played with a lot of singers that like do that. Really? It's like a total sports mentality thing. It's always the guys <laughs> that like played sports in high school and the night of the show they have the biggest jug of water you can find at Costco and they're just gulp, gulp. And uh Chris told me one time, he's like, that doesn't help because if you're not hydrated before like twelve hours before or whatever, like your body takes time to be hydrated. You can't just instantly hydrate yourself that's true and it could work against you because if you're trying to use your diaphragm and you filled up your stomach and with your water, stomach's full yeah then you're gonna burp into the microphone and <laughs> i've done that too <laughs> the worst dude, My- is drinking a red bull before you go on stage i've done that a bunch then you have a red yeah. bull burps into the mic <laughs> it's not pleasant how about chewing gum have you ever tried the chewing gum while you're singing thing oh the dave grohl yeah just a while Never. you're singing i could did it not. one time at the gypsy lounge back in the day i was like i'm gonna try this because it makes sense you're chewing so it produces more saliva, so you're less dried up. I guess that's the concept. Yeah. And right away, I went to take a big breath to take it to hit a note, and I was like, Oop, swallowed it, <laughs> it <laughs> like on the down. first song. I was like, I'm not doing that again. Yeah, that's danger. There's a, just made me think of this. There's a, U, a former UFC fighter, um, and he, he would always have a toothpick in his mouth throughout the entire fight. What? Why? Like literally, he would, the fight would be done. Um, Benson Henderson is his name. You Google it. The fight would be done, and immediately there'd be a toothpick sticking out of his mouth, and there'd be like, "How did that come? What's going on there?" And he's like, "I train with it in." So the whole fight, he never had a problem. Mouth. Yeah, he hides it somewhere, and then all of a sudden there's a toothpick. Weird, but that's probably for him. Just Fighting. gets him in the, I don't know, some sort of headspace. Maybe or it calms him down or something. Dude. I don't know what it is, but Weird. a sharp object in your mouth while someone's punching <laughs> in the mouth. <laughs> or getting choked. <laughs> Maybe he wants to use it as a weapon. So if you're getting choked out, you can just spit it at their eye. Just psh, psh. Oh, yeah. A little That's secret toothpick. It's like a ninja move. That's what I would do. The double starred edge Chinese star. Um, okay. This is a the, vocal the, podcast. This is a singing podcast. Yeah, it really became one. I like it. To take it back to where it started, though, I always felt like maybe for myself <clears throat> that because of my disabilities, <laughs> you have disabilities. No, my inabilities. I just felt like the thing I had, like, it was like I need to. First of all, I it, my songs. I I need to have better song. I need to have great songs, mm-hmm. and I need to be utterly emotional. And because it's not going to be because I'm. A great singer it's going to be because i'm as honest and emotional as i can mm. possibly be and Which it helped way me better than help me raise the bar i don't know and then i also really i think this is a weird thing this is an interesting topic too is like for some reason what i felt like i had to say through singing involved me having a high range and maybe it's like i yeah. i loved a lot of singers that had really high ranges like you know, Sting and Jeff Buckley and Chris Cornell and, yeah. and I mean, you can hear me talking now. Like I think my voice, I'm probably like a really, really low tenor or even a baritone maybe if you were to like rank my voice on the operatic spectrum. Yeah, your which voice I sounds great about. up high. What I had to push, dude, I didn't have any of that when I started. Really? I had to just like, I don't know what I did. Just push it up, but you keep getting higher and higher. Ball peen mm-hmm. hammer on the crotch area. Mm-hmm. I had to just, it's like, I'm get I'm, singing those notes and then i read something once that said you're only physically limited lower range in the lower range yeah i read that too yeah so I you read can, that same book yeah you did <laughs> it talked about vocal adduction which is basically yeah that's what the vocal teacher i went to was all about it might have been that's, that's who where I read. you squeeze your thomas yeah appel it might have been him that i read that guy i took the lessons from him he's hilarious he's so weird <laughs> hi thomas great though like his whole he had a whole program yeah because you're basically what his thing was is that people who sing high either they have small vocal cords and that's high hmm. if that's if they're like their speaking voice is high whatever um <clears throat> but what you do like your vocal cords are like shaped like this or whatever mm-hmm. approximation but the it's almost like fretting your vocal cords so you right. like you close the end of them and make the vibrating length shorter like mm-hmm. on a string on a guitar yeah, and if you learn how to do that with your vocal cords, it becomes effortlessly effortless to sing high. Whereas a lot of people, when they push to sing high, they stretch their vocal cords, which uh, is yeah, the same yeah. as like tightening, tightening the string. Yeah, so you're straining. You're straining. Yeah. So once I heard about that, I was like, okay, well then, what does that feel like? And 
you know, when am I doing that and not doing it? And then I just like pushed and pushed and pushed until I had the upper register that I w- wanted. Mm-hmm. But it meant that I went through lots of straining and bull crap. What do you think but about uh, sp- specifically guys speaking? What do I think voic? about dudes? What do you think about dudes specifically? What do you think about guys uh, where they put their speaking voice? Because like it's not. You know what I mean? You don't just like push a button and your voice comes out. You have to put a pitch to your voice when you're speaking. Yeah. Have you ever thought yeah. about where you where you put your voice when you're talking? Well, I've <laughs> cuz they say if you like if you the more monotone you speak like in terms of like uh, yeah, notes, vocal dysphonia. It's bad. Like <clears throat> I've even noticed it before playing a show. If I'm I try to kind of be more animated with my voice because then it, it it's almost better for your singing voice. Does that make any sense? It does. And I've heard, well, I don't even remember what I heard. So this is red alert, but Italians, there we go. Speak Speak with the hands. Well, they're, they're, is it the romantic languages? But for Mm -hmm. sure, Mm -hmm. Italians um, in Italy have very melodic voices. It's like Mm -hmm. part of the culture to sing or to talk in a very melodic way and use a wide range. Mm -hmm. And, the same place that I heard this, it was like Americans are more known for mon- Taking monotonous. Low note, yeah. yeah. And even it's a weird cultural thing. There's a, um, I forget what the, the problem is called, but uh, executives often get it. And I think sometimes women in, in corporate situations have been known to get it, but they oh, yeah. speak at the lowest possible point of their vocal cord and they get nodules it. like yeah I, right it makes you sound more I, I really important think that's a good idea yeah to, yeah uh make that deal and we can yeah and you hear that person be... you're like that's not where your voice is supposed to go right like, that's not natural and they go home and they're like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but but mom <laughs> now i've thought about that hearing myself back you know what sometimes i'll notice when i'm trying to be polite or something mm-hmm. i'll be like i think Vo- I think I'm speaking like really like high and trying to sound. <laughs> It'll always be in hindsight though. Like, if, have I been talking like really high for some reason? <laughs> I don't know. About what about you, sir? I, that's something I've thought about. I've had to change, <clears throat> and it was it was it's weird. It should be the other way around. But I le- I feel like I learned how. Well, I guess it makes sense. I feel like I learned how to speak properly through learning how to sing. Oh yeah, because it's the same thing with like the mask that you're supposed to put your voice here. Once I started doing that with my speaking voice, I, I was fine because I I would always lose my or jack my vo- my singing voice up when I after, if I talk too much. Oh, interesting. And it was because I was trying to be like I have a low voice. Whoa. And at one point I was like, that's not. It's probably not good. Dude, that is weird. Well, I, you know what I've heard a lot is that um, when people hear my voice for the first time and I'm like there for it or something. This is this happening? <laughs> I don't know. You mean is recorded? That, or when people meet me and know me for a while and then hear my music, uh, yeah. often people will be like, that's you? Because it's higher than your speaking voice? I don't know. Or it doesn't sound like me talking when I'm singing. Yeah. And I don't know what that means. But well, I think well, part of it that? is that I do, I have a bunch of different ways I sing. Mm-hmm. Which gets back, dude. I wanted to talk about more about the subject of how much thinking goes on mm-hmm. when you're when you're doing music, whatever you're doing, singing, playing, whatever. Let's let's get back to that. But I think part of it, um, see, that was a really high burp, like kind of like you know, feminine burp, if I might. Feminine burp. Or it was very. I'll take it. I it was like a polite burp. I was once I was like mistaken the, the burp for of, a, a, of a small a petite. bird. Petite bird. I like to burp like a bird. One time I was told, uh, somebody heard me singing on a recording and they, who's doing the back, what, uh, who's that chick doing the background? <laughs> I was like, that's me. That's oh, a- I'm so-. And they were like, oh, I'm sorry. I took, I was like, that's a compliment. That's an ill-informed ear though, right? No, it was a music executive. It was uh, someone that worked for um, Tooth and Nail. Wow. You do have a very mellifluous. It was like a high falsetto thing. And like, yeah. Who's the girl that's singing that pretty background vocal and I said that's me and instantly I took this it as a girl. compliment which most I think most people would be like hey man most dudes would be like that's not a girl <laughs> I think it's a compliment only because girls yeah. are usually better singers yeah falsetto that comes with the territory I guess anyways what were, what were what the heck thinking 
Yeah, thinking. Uh, but I was going to say something else, whatever. But yeah, thinking, like I've always had, um, I feel like I can't do anything without, if, if, I, if I don't have like a, a way that I think about it, feel like everything will suck all the time. What do you mean? I don't know. Like, You mean have a structure? I don't feel like there's anything I do other than maybe uh, perception-oriented things that come natural. Like I hear something and go, oh, that's this. Like that's uh, like perceiving time or perceiving uh, timbres or... Perception oriented things come natural, but I think anything that I do, like playing drums, mm-hmm. it doesn't, like, I never was like, oh, yeah, I just do it. I don't know how I do it. Like, I just sit down and play. Man. Oh, right, right. Like, even after, like, something second nature, if I don't have, like, a mindset mm-hmm. that allows my heart set to come through the mindset. Whoa, heart set. <laughs> Did you just make that up, or is that? <laughs> I think I've said it before. I've never heard heart set before. <laughs> I like it. It's a thing. <clears throat> But I think if, if if I don't have that, here's how I'm approaching it thing, right. it all just will completely suck. It'll mm. be bad. Like, if I just sit down and play drums, I think the time would be everywhere. I have to have, like, a picture of how I'm thinking about time in which yeah. I play in. That's pretty cool. For which to play in. <laughs> from which to play from. <laughs> and then singing's the same way. Like, I have to, Heart for it to work... <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying that. Heart set. Heart set. If I I have to go like okay, I'm going to I'm going to breathe like this. I'm going to do this thing and then it will set up everything else. You're talking about playing drums? Drum anything. <clears throat> drums. Even even, dr- even when you sit down especially drum drums and singing. And huh. I used to get obsessive with it. And with drumming it was weird cuz it was like a I came to to learn that it was it's called synesthesia where a two senses get mixed together. So like Whoa. a common one is like um, uh, maybe you see something or no, here, here's a better one. You smell something and you see a color or. Oh, from, oh yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. So for, and a lot of people, they hear something and they see a color. Yeah. yeah. So like, oh, that sounds pink. And, yeah. and you're, and people are like, why, why pink? And like, I don't know. I just see pink. Yeah, yeah. So it's very pretentious sounding, <clears throat> but it's also a real phenomenon. And for some reason, for me, sounds, especially like rhythms, I see as shapes. So okay. when I was a teenager and I was sitting there frustrated trying to get my time really good, I realized that every drummer I heard had a shape. Hmm. So I would like, I'd be like, oh, if I just keep that shape in my head, or I started drawing the shapes on my snare, Whoa, if cool. I keep that shape in my head and play that shape, then my time will be perfect. Was, so, what shape is Stuart Copeland, for example? He's like squiggly uh, line all, goes all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> the shape tends to be, um, it's the way they feel co- the the quarter note okay. or the whatever gets the beat. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's a dotted quarter and six eight. But so let's just say for keep it simple. Like it's the quarter note is here, the next quarter note is here, and how they subdivide the quarter note. It's so usually between okay. backbeat and non backbeat. So one and three that two makes and the four, shape. That makes the shape. So interesting. So there'd be like kick, snare, and then anything in between that would create the shape that's in between it. So that like, kind of makes sense. There's people who sound. There's drummers like um, Jeff Porcaro and John Bonham and Peter Erskine, and it's a handful of drummers that have a pretty square shape. Um. So like, and then some drummers who have a shape that's a kind of like a rhombus. Okay. And then. There are drummers who have like a long, kind of oblong, rounded shape. And Stuart is in the triangle category. <laughs> he has very like angular. So I started okay. to think about like, oh, why that's why is that phenomenon <clears throat> happening? So with Stuart Copeland, his shape is angular and sharp. And part of it has to do with sonically what's happening. He has sharp tones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also a leaning shape, I would see as um Drummers who tended to push one of their hands, like he has a, okay. he has a, he leads with his right hand. So whenever he's playing a groove, it's like, you can tell it's like the what's holding the groove together is his right hand, 
and it's pushing. So he's got kind of rush it. He tends to rush and he pushes his right hand, but the snare drum, by virtue of physical things, but also maybe where he feels it, his snare drum tends to be a little behind the other things. Mm. And his kick drum tends to be the thing that's the most rooted and kind of like there. So that makes him tilt? So it makes him tilt, but it's like a consistent tilting. There's yeah. like this tension in the beat. And then when that tension gets out of control, it'll rush. But yeah. And then the drummers who feel like the most vertical and square are the ones who don't have tension inside their beat. It's just straighter and... Yeah, they. what I've noticed is it seems like they're feeling the pulse internally and then just playing to the pulse. And a lot of drummers that have that tilted feeling are like, this beat depends on me playing it. So it's like... <laughs> like I'm, it's not there. It's like, I'm here's the beat, <laughs> and then my yeah. kick and snare are going to like lock into that thing. Whoa, that's killer. And what happens is those drummers, when they go to play a fill a lot of times the groove will fall apart a little, right, but in a good way because yeah. they, they've given up on that crutch. So it's like, and it kind of goes away. To, yeah. But then these drummers like Porcaro and Bonham, Steve Ferroni, uh, Peter Erskine, they have, it sounds like floating on a cloud, yet it can be really intense. They're, yeah. One of the analogies that I thought of was like, let's say you're driving in a car, and there's a hole in the floor <laughs> and you're mm -hmm. driving in a very dangerous way, like over the dotted lines, mm -hmm. um, whatever the dashes are. What's the, what are those things called? The, the lane dividers? Dashes. So let's say you're going like 20 miles an hour and you're just seeing like dash, dash. Well, you're looking out the window. Okay. Dash. I like the dash, hole in the floor thing. Dash. <laughs> it kind of ruins the analogy. Okay. So you're looking out the window and the dashes are going by. And you're going to consistent speed. So there, that's basically a visual click track. Okay. Dash, dash, dash. The drummers that are like, have an angular groove where there's tension in it. Oh, the, <laughs> the point of this is you have a ball in your hand and the idea is to place the ball on the dash. Right, so you're right on the beat. So you're right on the beat. So the drummers that have that tension in the groove and tend to be what I would see as tilted in this shape thing it's like you would see the dash coming and throw the ball at it. Throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball. <laughs> uh, I hit it, I missed it. Uh. Mm -hmm. The drummers who have this upright shape, they literally go, I know when the dash is going to be here, and they just drop the ball, mm -hmm. drop the ball, relaxed. Boom, mm. there's the beat. You see how you can, you can aim at that dash yeah. with a bunch of intensity and, and anticipation, or you can be like, I know when it's coming, and drop it. Yeah. And so those drummers tend to look relaxed. They tend to just like have a certain kind of, they even place themselves in gravity different. That's another thing I noticed more recently. You mean the posture wise? Yeah, you can see in their posture that they're not leaning mm -hmm. and they're, they're very centered. They have a good center of gravity. And so when they play, there's no tension in their body either. Mm -hmm. So their body becomes more of an expression of their mental state. And when you look at these drummers that have this intense feeling, usually they're like leaning towards the hi-hat or leaning towards the ride. Yeah. And they create this thing in their body that if they were to go play a different drum, their center of gravity has to shift. Yeah, and yeah. therefore the time shifts because... Yeah, because every different... little millisecond it counts Yeah, with rhythm. Like think of it in the extreme. <clears throat> like imagine if I put you as off balance as I possibly could on the drum throne and then said, now play a shuffle <laughs> on the ride. Mm -hmm. And you're you're almost falling off the stool towards the ride, mm -hmm. and then I said, okay, now during <laughs> while playing, go off balance totally toward the hi hat and switch to the hi hat. Yeah, the chances of their time being consistent would be like nil. Yeah, it's impossible. But if you're totally centered and you could choose ride or hi hat with no change in your body gravity and your balance, the chances of your time would stay solid is like way higher. Is this getting back to why you think everyone should play drums? Or learn how to play drums, because <laughs> well, the, well, seriously, like the same way that I I get annoyed with musicians that don't want to learn how to sing, yeah, even though they could, is is the same. Like everybody should learn rhythm. Every musician should learn. You don't have to sit down on a drum kit, but like you should learn this kind of minutia of rhythm, because it translates to everything. To your guitar playing, if you're a guitar player, to whatever, whatever, every other instrument. But only drummers talk and think like this. 
Yeah. Well, I think there are two reasons why I would say that. Is one is because I kind of feel like the drums are the foundation, and the and the vocal is the cherry on top. So if you mm-hmm. understand what's at the bottom and what's at the top, mm-hmm. then that sort of is like a cool. It's like you understand the frosting and you understand how to bake the cake or something. Yeah, yeah. And then also like, I think drums and yeah, I think vocals and drums do both are like this. Is that those are two instruments that I think you can physically. You can manifest emotions physically to a hundred percent, and that's a valid way of playing the instrument. So oh, okay. you can hit the drums as hard as you can, mm-hmm. and it's valid. You can sing as hard as you can. You can scream, mm-hmm. and that's, that's a valid just expression. Thing, yeah, but, but if you hit a guitar as hard as you can, it's you ruined, break it. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah, you, or you squash the sound of that instrument. Yeah, or in most cases, I mean, if you hit as hard as you could, unless you have crazy strings on that thing. You're going to ruin, mm-hmm. I mean, even a bass with big, heavy strings, if you hit it too hard, it's not going to be, a, it's just going to, yeah, it doesn't sound good. So you have to restrain your emotion on most instruments and mm-hmm. actually like yeah, that's true. figure out like, oh, how am I going to get this emotion that's a thousand miles wide, <laughs> but re, but restrain it enough so it's within the confines physically of that instrument. Like you're more powerful yeah. than the instrument. Right. I think vocally and drum wise, now it's not necessarily sustainable to hit as hard as you can or sing as hard as you stand you can, but but it is a valid expression. Yeah. So there's something about, I mean, there's there's nothing better than if you're feeling in, in some intense emotion and you can sit behind the drums. Oh yeah, you can literally beat the crap out of them and get that emotion out yeah. physically. And if you're feeling, that's why in some of my music I scream like. The, the ability to have that full blown thing, yeah, and maybe when it like in guitar, it's like, oh, I can crank the amp to ten, right? That's why and I, max out exactly. my ears. <laughs> That's why guitar players tend to get so nerdy about gear. I think it's true because a tube or or a pedal or something that you could put in between you or something that helps make that sound. Yeah. That's what does that. It's not your hand hitting the guitar really hard. But it, I mean, it's different. That's awesome. But it also gives you the same feeling. Especially, dude, there's nothing like, you know this, standing and playing with a rock band and and standing in front of your amp, a big amp and cranking it up. I mean, there's so much stuff happening. There's electricity, there's like air being pushed, and you actually feel it. And it's not you hitting your guitar harder. It's like it's voltage. It's like this other thing that's like invisible and that's what's giving this kind of emotion. Dude, I'm totally tripping out right now. Bro! I've just never... Get down to it! It's a cool connection of the thoughts because like... And it's interesting that it requires um, electricity. Oh, that is cool. Whereas the voice and drums, all you need is this object. Right, but you, I thought you were going to say and like... you. The electricity in your... Everybody has electricity in your body. It's oh, that's a whole other level. I thought we were going there, bro. Let's, let's go Take there. Take it down. But I think all the, the way. There's something visceral about the voice. There's something visceral about drums. And they're yeah. probably the two oldest instruments. Right. Yeah. Because obviously there was very little technology required to, Good point. to make both. But there's a sophistication, obviously, to amplified instruments. And like... Yeah. But that's killer that, that it is like you get this visceral thing through the amp like through the mm-hmm. but that's why people are so obsessed but it's with guitar amps and gear and in this and that and the tubes and the that and the transformers and because that's where the power that's that's where that comes from that's where that energy comes from yes and in recording that's where i get in love with room mics and in love with compression because i right. want drums to sound like they sound when i'm playing them yeah like, yeah and it require in order to get that kind of like unbelievable impact that you feel when you're playing and you have you can't just get that by putting a mic on a drum right right it just doesn't translate for some reason or at least not to me but electricity yeah where, where were you going with that tesla over hey, there nah. well i just Edison? Instant, people don't realize it but um like for example i do electrical work and and i can when you get shocked you're you're your your body is being is is being grounded, so the so the electricity is going through you because electricity yeah. is always looking for ground. That's why lightning like shoots to the ground. It's looking for it, it like that's its partner or whatever. Mm-hmm. So when you get, let's say you get electrocuted and you die, if if it's such a strong shock that it kills you, it's because it stops your heart. 
because it interferes with your own electricity. Everybody has like electrical impulses and stuff. Yeah. That's just, I don't know how that works because we're plugged into something. We don't know what we're plugged into, but we're plugged into something that gives us that electricity that makes your heart beat. And, and the way I understand it is, is if you get a big enough shock that goes through your body, it's, it's so dynamically different than your body's electricity that it interrupts it and just, you can just shut it off. So it's just, it's just more electricity. And then if you look at a guitar amp, you know, and the voltage thing, especially when it comes to rock, you know, uh, guitar, like a Van Halen, like it's, it's all voltage based. And then that's where all this like, well, I don't know why we hear that and think that's powerful, but we do. Maybe it's because we ha of the electricity, you know? Interesting. I would put forth that maybe it has more to do with sound waves. I wonder. Of course. Yeah. But how do but how do those like the, But it's like a frequency and which is a kind of another form of above so, Yeah. I wonder how electricity plays a role in that. So I think the idea of standing in front of a loud guitar amp is that it's like you said, it's like moving air. Air, yeah. It's hitting you and it's like it's equal to the your emotions or something. It's I guess it's it's this weird connection between an inner experience which who knows what electrical factors are involved in like when right. you feel a certain way or think a certain thing. Yeah, your brain's Obviously your brain's too. firing with electricity. But that's like, it's almost like we're trying to manifest in the physical, in the we're trying to manifest in sound waves a representation of what's going on electrically in our brains. Mm -hmm. It's weird. I know, I'm kind of getting out of my depth here. I'm just guessing. I'm way out of my depth. But that's Deep, the Deepak, same thing. Deepak Chopra would just say it's it's the quantum. <laughs> yeah. It's something quantum. But it is cool. I think that's the maybe that's a um a bro science mm -hmm. version of physics relative to art. Mm -hmm. Like we're trying to create something symbolic that's a representation of thought and emotion. We want, we want to manifest thought and emotion in the physical world mm -hmm. in a way that's actually outside our body. Outside of your own. We want, to we want it to be outside our body, but we want that, that thing that's outside our body to hit our body. The way that it hits you internally or, or the, the way, way you it, feel it or whatever. Internally. Yeah, there's something going on there where it's like you, you hit a drum emotionally and then the drum hits you. Ooh. <laughs> you hit a guitar and then the amp hits you. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It, it is like a, it's a conversation between your emotions and the physical world and you want that thing to hit back at you right. and then you want that to hit people and you want the people to hit you back. Mm -hmm. It's a big, everybody's hitting everything. Well, I wonder how much uh, some sort of electrical pulse has to do with the way you feel an emotion. Because if it starts in your head and there's these electrical impulses that are firing to neurons and there's all that stuff going on then that can produce an emotion from that kind of electric thing. Ooh. It's all the same thing, but it's just another way of getting it. Say that again. I'm just, I've never actually even thought about this before, but I'm just saying, how, do you, how does your emotion play into that? Does it, like, does it start from that, those electrical impulses? And then it creates, at some point, it, it turns into some, like a feeling. Ooh. Not a physical, but like an emotional feeling. You know, that, that brings up a lot of thoughts about, like, um, where do these things come from? You know, like, mm -hmm. you hear Jordan Peterson a lot of times talk about how we're not transparent to ourselves. Like, we don't, we don't know right. where, what consciousness really is or where stuff comes from. We can kind of, like, watch it happening. But, like, we were talking about this a little bit before we started the podcast, which is, like, chicken or the egg. What comes first, thought or emotion? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people think it's like you think something and then you feel about it. Mm -hmm. And that um, there's a lot of strength to the idea uh, or validity to the idea that like it's really that um, we have these feelings and we have all this subconscious stuff going on in our consciousness that we're not, we're not consciously aware of it. And then we have thoughts about it. And then we we try to justify the the feeling with a thought, mm -hmm. and and that our thoughts and opinions and our actions are are, are 
<laughs> are a result of us justifying these deeper beliefs and thoughts that we have. So like, um, you know, like, oh, that person said this about me. Like, I think I, you know, I should punch them in the face, you know? And it's like, well, maybe, you know, you were triggered to some conscious, maybe what they said really, you could, you could decide to blow it off, but there was like, there's some deep feeling in you. Like road rage is a good example. Like you get triggered into an emotion Mm -hmm. and then you justify the action. But really like you have this deep, like again, like not enough hugs as a kid or something. Like you're like this pent up thing. You're looking for a way to be violent, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then all you need is that one reason Mm -hmm. to justify the violence. But you might go to the, to your grave saying like, no, no, no. Like I was just, it was basically Mm self-defense because this person said this thing and I got triggered. Yeah. I don't know. I thought you were going to say in the same way, like if somebody criticizes you for something, if, if, if you get completely just thrown off and, and emotionally just hurt by it, it's probably because there's something you kind of agree with in it Ooh, you know what yeah. I mean? that's when it really hurts the most is when you know like a little bit of truth in it that makes you even more upset or that that amplifies that emotion even more yeah that's a whole other <clears throat> subject of like yeah being found out i guess in a way or called mm-hmm. out on something that's the worst man something that you know already yeah you know something's up dude nothing hurts more than that it could be like the smallest thing but if you are already thinking it kind of somewhere or you've already thought it about yourself and someone else brings it up. Yeah. It's like, it just get, it's naturally going to come out as like, especially the more, the more in denial you are about that thing, the worse it is. Yeah. Or the more it's plaguing you, I guess. And somebody calls mm-hmm. it out, almost feels mean. Cause you're like, oh, don't you know how much I'm struggling with that? Right. Like, and you're yeah. going to call it out. Yeah, you know, it's sad. It's sad. It is kind of sad. Especially if it's something like, I don't know, something physical or, or, you know. Right. Like if you had. Something really, you're born with. Yeah, lateral lisp. If you had a really bad lateral lisp and lateral. somebody says, like makes fun of your lisp. Yeah. It can be any direction, lateral, vertical. So this is another reason to, to be um, honest in what you're doing. Stop like, it. I know I have a lisp. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why like, let's, like a fat comedian will go up on stage and the first thing he says is like a fat joke about himself. And yeah. then that just disarms the whole thing. And, and then nobody, nobody can think it anymore and nobody can. Like, I've already made fun of myself. Yeah. With this thing that's obvious that you're going to make fun of. I did that very thing on this podcast. What'd you do? <laughs> I was like, what happened since the last podcast and this podcast? And I'm like, well, oh, yeah. I've gained a few pounds. <laughs> you know, so like, yeah, if, you, if you're the one that says it first, then you win a little bit. <laughs> yeah, or it, it, it disarms it. It, it um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's true. It takes a little bit of the power away. But that's I just being vulnerable. That's like vulnerable and being yeah, o- as completely open as you can and just being, oh, I know this sucks about me. I'm just going to say it. So that you can't say it. Yeah. How does that apply to you saying that you're not confident? Does it apply? It doesn't because I would never have said that before. I would have just acted confident. You know, uh, now I'm just getting older and I just try to let go of all that stuff. Yeah, it is true. And um, we're here talking into microphones. And I think the best, you know, conversations that, that I, that I listen to are when people are completely vulnerable. You know what I mean? So it's almost I think that's what people want. I think people need to, nobody wants to hear someone just talk great things about themselves, no matter how great they are. You know, you want to hear, and you want to hear really, not that we're brilliant, smart people, but the brilliant, smart people we like to listen to, I love it when they are vulnerable. Oh yeah. Like you mentioned Jordan Peterson, you hear him and he'll just get to the point where he's like, this is something I don't understand. I'm just kind of, talking about it i'm at the end of my understanding you're, hit, or you're like whoa getting to the edge of tears talking about people coming up to, to him after his speaking right. engagements like right that's and that's get, embarrassing to do that yeah but it gives you like gives you a little portal into his what's important to him right and that's how we connect with people you know what's interesting i heard i heard it said that like um i watched <laughs> this documentary on documentary documentary makers documentarians mm-hmm and they said that there's a fascinating thing that like you can be <clears throat> like they'll go into a place and setting up the microphones and getting the cameras ready and about to interview somebody. And, you know, there's that politeness and whatever. Mm-hmm. You throw the camera on and all of a sudden people will tell you things they wouldn't tell the piece, the, the closest mm-hmm. people to them. Weird. 
things they wouldn't even tell their family. Why is that? I don't think they had an answer for it, but we can pontificate on <clears throat> what we think. But I think there's something about... Maybe it's because they want to get it out. You want to get it out, and it's almost like, oh, you put a camera on me, here's my chance to say it to yeah. everyone at the same time instead of one specific person who might judge me. I right. don't know. Or it's almost like a... I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's a, I guess a chance to vent. Therapy's like that. In a way, maybe that's mm -hmm. a therapeutic environment is when somebody you don't yeah. know is asking you what you think and feel or to tell a story. That's, yeah, that makes sense because you're not, if you can talk about yourself outside of a situation, like you, if you can talk about a situation that you're in, Safer. you're not in it right there, it's, it's almost like it's easier to step back from it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting about that. To bring it back to me. <laughs> Let's talk about me. Well, I just, I've thought recently, like I miss performing as an artist and I just, the first thing I think is like, no, I'm not, like there's been a couple occasions where, hey, you want to come sing? And I'll be like, no, I'm kind of on hiatus from that. But internally I go, yes, I absolutely would love to come yeah. sing for sure, but I'm not going to. And then the thing I think is like, oh, it would be great to go out. Like I wish I could just like drive to Wisconsin and do a bunch of gigs. For people that you don't know. And as long as people don't know me and then nobody's yeah. like filming it. If I could just go do it anonymously. Mm -hmm. Not that I have to worry you about can, anonymity, you, but... You can do that. Any gig I do is basically anonymous. But <laughs> I think just the idea of like, this is just happening for random people and it's a one-time thing and yeah. I'm just doing it. Right. That just says a lot about maybe like insecurities or something. But just the idea of doing it with nothing at stake is for maybe sure. like the dream. For sure. Well, it's also, the, it's also the hardest crowd you'll ever perform in front of is a room of, like before people that you know, especially musicians, but just people that you know. If if, if, there's, if there's like, t if it's a small club and you're playing a gig or whatever, and there's like fifteen or twenty people there that you are that you know, that's the hardest. That is that is the hardest gig because you know them and you know what they think and you know you know what I mean. Like this is what's crazy, man. Is I think this is one of the, like. I consider you to be like a kindred spirit in a lot of ways. Yeah. And in this weird 20 year friendship we've had, we've hung out very little yet stayed very close. And then mm -hmm. recently have spent a lot of time together working on music and stuff and gotten more tight, I think. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> you're welcome. Here's a, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, but this is an area that is like, so we're so different. Like I would feel like, maybe the opposite in that scenario like i like you'd be I would, more comfortable around your family and friends or something i don't i guess it's or like an intimate an intimate show would be the ultimate whereas mm -hmm. a lot of people say like ooh, intimate shows are horrible give me a stadium full of people and then i'll feel comfortable oh yeah um and i guess that comes down to maybe i don't know there's a part of me that really want i want to be known and i want to know like i want mm -hmm. to understand people and i want to know people on a as deep a level as i can and I want people to know me on that level. Then I almost feel like, because I feel that way about songwriting and singing, that like, oh, this is where I can get this stuff that I can't get out any other way. I can get it out. It's a, it's a, it's a tool for me to, to, to feel like I exist and that I'm mm -hmm. understood, I guess. Mm -hmm. So to be able to do that in front of people I knew, I feel like there's some belief I have that like, oh, now they'll get me more and then I'll feel closer to them. That makes sense too. And that if I can get that somehow from them... Like the ultimate would be like everybody gets to go up on stage and right. and sing and or or do whatever it is they do that they that they can like come totally honest and vulnerable. Yeah. I feel like some, we get caught up so much in like patterns of inauthentic speech and interactivity. I guess it's mm -hmm. really easy to do that, and I think that's why I value the the small handful of friends I have where that's like welcome and important and like you're you're down to dive into it and i wish you were like that just kidding Whoa. <laughs> no you i would consider you in that small group of people that i know that yeah. that that are down to just dig in or just the you know willing to put it out there no matter yeah. what or whatever and it's yeah yeah i think so, i i feel the same way i mean i was just saying that earlier before we started before we turned the mics on i I value this a lot because I don't have a ton of people. I mean, I do have a lot of musician friends, but yeah. don't sit down very often and and get 
into the weeds with this kind of stuff with a lot mm-hmm. of people. I just think it's not important to, to people that aren't doing something creative or doing or aren't don't have that introspective thing. Or yeah, what? on a normal basis, I think everybody does, but I don't know. Like, it's just important to us. Yeah, it's a weird thing that I think it's the most important. Yeah, so, what is that? I, know, I don't know. But that's why I like this kind of. That's why I like listening to people talk because that's to me is that's the most important thing. I don't know why. It's yeah. That's I mean that's the reason why I think I wanted to start the podcast up again is that <clears throat> podcasts have, have become an important part of my life. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a place to learn. It's a place to sort of um, I don't know. You're interacting with people you would not otherwise know, so you almost feel like you're a fly on the wall. Like mm-hmm. I feel like I'm there. Yeah. talking but yeah. i'm just not talking well to me it's the same thing you just said if you were in a room full of people and you were playing your music you that would be the best way for you to feel like you're almost like there's no. a little more of a connection or yeah. something you're known that i kind of feel that way too when i'm listening to smart people talk i feel like there's a validation like finally oh, cool. somebody's smart enough <laughs> <laughs> someone else is just like me brilliant no, but you kind of feel there's a validation like oh this person thinks those kind of weird thoughts too or this this person's uh Processes things in a sense. Of, yeah, hashtag me way. too. Yeah, just like that. No, it's totally, it's totally that, and that's like a. It's interesting. It's vicarious too. Mm-hmm. Like I've thought about that a lot, especially in 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 starting to podcast again. I think the worst thing, like I've gone back, like when I'm like editing the podcast from before, you know, like getting them ready to put out, and then little moments in there will be like I'll hear it like. like like cringeworthy moments of the conversation, like moments when you can tell there's like a sense of like, oh, what are we going to talk about now? Or like, Mm -hmm. let's get comfortable or whatever. Like that's not what you want. (laughs) I don't know where I'm going with this. Well, you want to hear people, you want to hear someone that's comfortable enough to open up into their own brain a little bit. Yeah, and it's funny how that's hard to do. Um, Hard to do when you're in when when you're in a grind of life with somebody. Maybe maybe it's like hard to yeah. kind of break it down and like. That's true, man. That's why you got to go to couples therapy. And maybe when it's maybe it's an introvert t- thing too, you know. Like if you're if you tend to be more less extroverted and you're more somebody who's kind of in your thoughts, mm-hmm. you don't want to really. First of all, it takes a lot of energy that you that you're not naturally gifted with to mm-hmm. to talk. That's that's a really good point because and it steals energy and then you also feel like you're burdening people with all your thoughts. Totally, that's so crazy. So this is like a weird narcissistic way to like go like podcast. You're supposed to talk about yeah stuff. That's so funny because my my wife is very um, she's uh, very articulate and outspoken and she she's just a completely open person and she she'll just talk 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 and uh, <laughs> probably shouldn't say it like that. <laughs> blah 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 blah. Edit. No, but I, I always wish I was like that. I wish I, you know, at the end of the day, you know, she'd tell me how her day is, whatever, and I do not want to talk about my day at all. I just don't. Unless it's something like really fun. Is like, it because you don't like your day usually? No, I, and I always ask myself that question. It already Why happened. can't I just open up and tell her like the mundane stuff that she'll tell me about her day and I'll listen, but I just don't, like you said, I don't have the energy for it or something, or I don't want to like bring it up again because all day I'm in my head. I don't want to just takes a lot to get that out. Is it because what right. happened is less important than what's going on inside you? I don't know, maybe. So I do find that extroverted people are are a little bit more pr- focused on the external. They're focused on what happened and mm-hmm. what's going on. And introverted people are kind of in swimming around maybe in their reactions to things. Mm-hmm. And once a thing happens, it's like it's done. So mm-hmm. talking about maybe what's going on with you or how you reacted to those things is maybe more interesting than filling somebody in on facts. On the details, yeah. Because that's what you're doing when someone says, how's your day? You're you're not telling them how you feel. You're telling them what happened. Right. Unless there's, and maybe that's when you do talk is when there's like, oh, dude, this person did this. Maybe. I'm going to start paying attention to that because I want to know why I have this like wall where when it's my turn to share my mundane stuff about the day, I just first, I don't want to do it. Weird. Ooh, here's an example. So, okay, so you you're you do music and you make money doing it. You do music and you do it purely for the love of it. And then you do 
do this electrical work. Mm-hmm. I remember you talking, I don't remember exactly what you said, so I'll just let you go off on it. But here's my question. It's like, after we, let's say, have worked together the whole day on something, um, take, for example, even something that maybe was not as like artistically right up your alley. So like when we were working on that, the entitled song for the book club, Mm -hmm. that movie, When when we first had a recording of that, I remember you saying that you enjoyed coming home and like, playing the stuff for your wife. Mm -hmm. What part of that was like, did you want to share? Like, why did I? Yeah, why? I remember you saying that you did, right? I don't know. I've had this talk with her too. It's, there's something about collaborating with you and being, you know, in this kind of creative zone here that is, like we could work all day long and I would go home full of energy, can't sleep. Mm. But if I worked half a day doing anything else, I just feel like drained. (laughs) Like I can just pour myself into being musical and creative and it's almost like it, it just, like there's a deeper well there or something that actually makes me feel more energized. Yeah, when it's, I don't know. When it's good or even when it's bad, it's good, I guess. When you compare (laughs) it to most other things in life in terms of the work we're doing. Maybe that's the process. If you really enjoy the process of it, it just builds you up. Yeah, and the process is so multifaceted too. Like, right, it never gets boring. It's like it's not like it's not talking all day, and it's not creating all day, and it's not right. Or it's more specific. It's not writing lyrics all day. If we're writing a song, right? Or it's it's a not bunch just of doing music. Stuff. You know, all day. It's not just mixing all day. It's not just. Um, you know, getting sounds all day. It's not just talking to someone about ideas all day. It's like all those things. Yeah. And then she's constantly like looking around, like trying to pick things out of the air. Yeah. And it's the create, the creativity aspect too is just so, if you're, if you walked in and there's nothing and you walk out and there's something mm-hmm. that wasn't there before and, and it's so multifaceted. That's the fascinating thing about songs is how multifaceted they are. They're like, Mm-hmm. Different levels of there's 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 some driving force that you're that you're coming from and writing it, and then if you're doing it collaboratively, you have to both sort of agree that that's the goal, sort of, but you're both bringing your s- different perspective to it, mm-hmm. and then you're trying to figure out what things and this gets back to our original com- that earlier conversation, like you have to figure out like what what physical things can we do that represent this weird mushy idea of the song mm-hmm. we're going after oh is it a guitar which guitar oh is it mm-hmm. are we picking are we strumming is it distorted is it acoustic whatever mm-hmm. you're making all these decisions and then all of a sudden you've created something that has some basis and things you've heard before but it's in a new context and you're mm-hmm. trying to make it fit an old fit a pre-existing kind of space you know mm-hmm. like oh this is we know we're aiming for an, you know like a pop song or whatever it might be mm-hmm but you want to give it your own spin. So then, and yeah, it's like, there's so many facets to it. And then mm-hmm. you're kind of negotiating or agreeing or right, disagreeing. Yeah. But I think the, the fact that you've made something, maybe that's like what it is. So fulfilling. Yeah. The fact that after you make it, there's something that just gives you like a, Oh wow. Something. I don't know what that is. Maybe that goes all the way back to creation itself, like making something. Yeah. <clears throat> no matter what it is. It's part of that like initial energy that created the universe or whatever it is. I'm getting a little over my head right now, but you know what I mean? Like you're tapping into that sort of fundamentally important thing. Yeah. Which is making something, you know, that's why people have to biologically, we want to have children for the same reason. Like you you have to like make something out of you. And what's weird is you're, it's almost like, um, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I almost said this, but Do it. I was going to say it's almost like nuclear energy. Whoa. But there's a famous quote, and I'm horrible with remembering quotes, but I'll paraphrase and I won't tell you who said it. So, <laughs> so you can't check it? I could have just acted like I said it. Oh. But basically, like that, that a great work of art is an endless source of energy. Ooh, never heard that. And, um, the fact that you can create something that if you if you if you do it well or even if you do it pretty well, 
that it's this source of energy, uh, emotional okay. energy. Like that's why songs are so great because they're this short little pocket of energy that all you have to do is press play mm -hmm. every time and then you, you can press it, yeah. repeat and then you can just keep pressing play and it can be a source of energy it can like give you something totally and you've created it it's, it is weird that's what art is like a great painting or a great mm -hmm. film you can just keep going back to it and if it's really good there are like tons of different layers of mm -hmm. um uh what would you call it like um Levels of analysis, you know, like you can get it on one level and you can mm -hmm. get it on a different level. You can get it from the level of like, um, that's why songs are so great. You can get it from the level of the lyric. You can get it from mm -hmm. the level of the music. Just the sound of it. If you look, yeah, from just the sound of it. Or if you're, if you're really into drums, you can get it from that level one day and then mm -hmm. you can listen to the vocal the next day. All right, guys, thanks for listening. We'll be back every single day. Week. Every single day, if you listen to the same podcast, seven days in a row. <laughs> and uh, I believe we're going to be calling this Broken City Music Podcast. Before it was Broken City Artists. And uh, so just to help with search engines and whatnot, this mm -hmm. is going to be music related, but it's going to be about whatever. And we're going to be your podcast buddies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from here on out. And one other thing is we, um, in order to help make this possible, we're looking to get your support if you feel like supporting and we'll have a patreon page which uh will be a link on the screen somewhere magically appear and then also there's um i already have the adam watts patreon that you can go to that and that'll help support this and my educational endeavors and my solo music and all the things that don't naturally really make money but that i'm passionate about and that mm -hmm. hopefully will make life better for more than just me if yeah. possible. And, and give us ideas, comments yeah. or whatever things you you want to hear people talk about. Comments, topics, whatever you want, man. It's a very broad um, genre here. So Yeah. See you next time. Good night and good morning. Yeah.